Hello, welcome back to Business Law. Today I'm going to lecture about Chapter 7, Business Ethics. Business ethics is a, little, is a little bit of a different ballgame than what we have covered so far in business law. So far, everything has been determined by written laws and, and, and rules and, and things we can go and look back at and, and decide what's right or wrong, or wrong. Business ethics is a little different because everybody has a different view of ethics and a different um, value system which kind of affects our ethics. And because businesses are run by people, individual people's um, ethical behaviors become very relevant in uh, business situations. Um, the other thing that's different is we have a lot of gray areas in ethics. And, and usually in the law, it's black and white written on paper, right? Um, and it can go through a court system and based on the written laws, we can decide whether something was right or wrong. Well, that's not always the case with ethics. So let me share the slides with you. So let's look at the textbook definition of ethics. As ethics is defined as the moral principles and values applied to social behavior. How do we act that uh, and how does it affect society? Business ethics means the application of moral and ethical principles in a business context. So let's look at again at the relationship of law and ethics. Um, there's usually a legal requirement. The legal requirement we as individuals and, and that businesses have is you have to follow the laws, right? If, if there's a law, you have to follow it. If you break it, then you did something wrong. Um, when we look at ethics, that's kind of the moral minimum. If all we do is follow the law in our societies um, uh, and we don't do anything above and beyond that, um, that might not be necessarily be ethical. Um, it's the minimum level of behavior that is expected by society and by businesses as well, right? Um, so uh, we really need to do a little more than that. Um, I did mention gray areas. There are gray areas of the law as, as well as ethical gray areas, which we're going to address more in this chapter. So there are different approaches to ethical reasoning. How do we come up with our way of thinking, right? So the first one we're going to discuss is called duty-based ethics. Duty-based ethics means people are following an ethical philosophy that is rooted in the idea that every person has certain duties to others, including humans and the planet. Um, so we, we, we kind of owe a duty to take care of others is basically what this means. Uh, out of duty based ethics also came the religious ethical principles. Uh, one of the cases that constantly comes up in business situations and the, which is more recent and which a lot of you are probably familiar with is the company Chick-fil-A. Uh, Chick-fil-A uses religious ethical principles to come up with their guidelines, with the way they run their business, with the way that what they're serving, or to how they're treating their employees, to uh, the messages that they are um, uh, giving to their customers and, and their employees, to uh, the organizations that they are financially supporting outside of their own organization. Um, and because they are controversial, because people have different views on especially religion. Um, they have been in the spotlight quite a lot. I encourage you to read more about it. You'll find a lot of interesting information and then you can form your own opinion. Another um, approach would be under duty-based ethics is the principles of rights approach. So when you're looking at the principles of rights approach, um, basically, you're looking at someone who has the belief that a key factor in determining if a business decision is ethical is how that if decision affects the rights of others. So um, basically, uh, you don't want to violate anybody's rights. Everybody has rights and not just legal rights, social uh, rights based on the societies you live in and, and so forth, right? So um, uh, somebody that's applying this uh, uh, reasoning theory would uh, want to make sure they're not going to violate anybody else's rights. Well, sometimes there are conflicting rights, right? The example we have in the textbook was uh, there was a company, Murray Chemical Corporation, and they had a dilemma. Um, they had to make a decision um, and the decision would have a negative outcome on either the employees 
or the environment, or in this case, the rivers, right? So if they stopped doing what they were doing, they would protect the environment and the rivers, and they would stop polluting. However, if they go with that decision, they would also um, have to lay off people. So um, who do they think about? Whose rights do they think about? Their employees or the environment? So this is a typical example of an ethical dilemma. The next one is Kantian ethical principles, which is based on the philosopher Immanuel Kant. Um, so there's a categorical imperative. So under this, it's defined as an ethical duty. Uh, I mean, an eth uh, ethical guideline is developed by Immanuel Kant under which an action is evaluated in terms of what would happen if everybody else in the same situation or category acted the same way? So sometimes we do something and we think, oh, it's only me, it's only one time. It's not going to make any difference. It's not going to hurt anybody. But you have to think about what if everybody did the same thing every time the situation came up. So let's think about, uh, let's uh, um, use, let me give you an example. For example, let's say you work at a company and um, uh, you need um, printer paper. You, your home printer ran out of printer paper and you don't wanna go stop by the store, but maybe you're, you have a, also a, a, a college paper due that you need to print out. So you're just taking a stack, a, a small stack of maybe 15, 20 sheets from the company printer and take, take that stack home so you can print your paper for your college class, right? So let's say it's a large company, some, you know, with maybe thousand employees. Is ever, anybody ever going to notice that? Does that have a huge impact on the company? No, it really doesn't, right? But let's say you have a thousand employees. Let's say a thousand employees every single day take about 15, 20 pages of printer paper home. Right. So now you have a much bigger impact because um, uh, when everybody is doing that behavior, the impact is going to be larger. And if that's the case, then um, um, you're if you're following this imperative. You would decide that is not the right thing to do. Um, there's also the utilitarianism approach. There's a cost benefit analysis determination of which individual jewels will be affected by which uh, by actions uh, in question and which will be affected both and what are you gaining and what are you losing uh, from this right um, uh, when you follow this um, uh, analysis you would come up with different alternatives right you don't only have you don't only come up with one solution but you want to come up with multiple solutions and then implement the one that has least negative um, uh, impact on the larger number of people, right? Um, I mean, on the, on the least, on the smaller number of people, oh, sorry. So uh, one way to explain this is when you have things like uh, approval for medicine and there's a problem with this approach, you wouldn't want to apply this approach because it could be devastating. Imagine there is a new drug that um, uh, saves people from a, you know, that, that treats people for a disease right? Uh, let's use cancer. A new drug was developed and uh, it cures 95% uh, of cancer patients. However, 5% that take this me medicine will die immediately. So should this medicine be approved or not? Should you say, well, we're saving 95% um, 5% are dying, but that's okay because we're saving more. When the outcome is devastating, such as death, you probably don't want to apply this approach. The next topic is corporate social responsibility, which is the idea that corporations can and should act ethically and be accountable to society for their actions. And the reason why company, corporations should do that is because when they do something unethical, the impact is much larger than when an individual does that, although an individual should not act unethically either, but corporations can have huge impacts. Imagine uh, uh, corporations uh, uh, dumping uh, hazardous waste illegally. Um, that could have a huge impact on the environment. And we've seen that throughout history and, and, and more, re more recently than in the past, right? 
Um, when you think about corporate social responsibility, um, you have to think about stakeholders. Stakeholders are groups that are affected by corporate decisions. So these are not just the shareholders. There's a difference between stakeholders and shareholders. Stakeholders are those, it's a big group that is affected by all the decisions or most of the decisions a company makes, right? Shareholders are only the owners of the company, right? So, but shareholders are part of the stakeholders. So when a corporation need, uh, makes decisions, they need to think about all their stakeholders. So about, they need to consider their shareholders, they need to consider their employees, they need to consider their customers, they need to consider their suppliers, they need to consider the government, and they need to consider the community. And, you know, then beyond those are all people and beyond that, of course, they need to consider the environment as well. So let's think about the importance of ethical leadership. Usually um, uh, people look at others and, and, and um, sometimes others that they admire or others that are just in charge at a company and they look at what their behavior and they think automatically assume, okay, in this company, it's okay to behave like that. So uh, um, hiring ethical management or, or, or train, hiring and keeping and training management and leaders, leadership um, roles that are filled with people with high standards of ethics can be very, very beneficial long-term for the company, right? Uh, when there's misbehaviors of the owners or managers, um, uh, it's, um, the employees are very likely to follow and also misbehave in a similar way. Companies should provide ethics training to employees, not only at the time they were hired, but it should be an ongoing training. Um, the Sarban oxley Act um, was implemented as an act that was implemented after a big scandal that happened back in 2000. Enron was a utility company in Southern California and they were doing really well, but then they weren't doing so well and they cheated and backdated their stock. So it looked like, you know, so the owner, the, the, the shareholders, the major shareholders and, and the upper level management was able to, to still benefit from selling their stocks. And, and, and while they were Mis misreporting the earnings of the company. So um, outcome was basically the, the whole company went out of business. People were jailed, people committed suicide. It was really, really ugly. The, the outcome was really ugly. But after that, the Sorbonne Oxley Act was implemented. And um, uh, besides, um, it's prescribed a lot of things as far as how public companies have to be monitored, how they report and how they get audited and so forth. They also implemented a web-based reporting system for employees. So if employees observe anything um, illegal that's happening in a company, anything that is questionable or highly unethical, um, that there's a way to report that. So here is a list of companies that um, come up often in my lectures about companies that uh, either behave unethically or had ethical dilemmas. Um, I encourage you to look these up and, and read more about them. Um, uh, sometimes students do presentations on these for extra credit in my regular classes. Um, um, another company that I have not listed here is Wells Fargo. The reason why I haven't listed Wells Fargo here is because I have a week, an assignment this week about well, the Wells Fargo and what they did a few years back and, and um, how um, their unethical behavior, highly unethical behavior, uh, blew up. So, um, and, and as a result, um, thousands of people lost their jobs. Um, uh, Wells Fargo's reputation got tarnished for a while. Um, uh, customers left and, and, and uh, so forth. So um, that is something that I would like you to discuss. And um, after this lecture, um, um, if we're doing um, lecture in person, we're going to get in groups. If not, um, you know how to do it online on the discussion boards. So uh, make sure you research the Wells Fargo case before you answer. Um, and I look forward to reading your responses. Um, that's it on ethics. There's, of course, a lot more in the, text, in the textbook, so make sure you read the chapter because this is only a very, very brief snapshot of what you will learn in the chapter. As always, there are also other interesting cases in the chapter that you can read about and, and you'll 
learn more. So um, anyway, um, until next lecture, goodbye.